good afternoon from London. Good morning to Mexico, where you are. Thank you so much for being part of this Emerging Payments Association project inclusion interview uh, for our report on, on ethics, lives, lifestyle uh, banking. What we would love to know immediately is maybe a bit of background about yourself and, and how you found yourself to be where you are today. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Rob Curtis, the CEO and co-founder of Daylight. Uh, Daylight is the first and only digital banking platform designed for America's 30 million LGBT consumers. Um, we are very lucky to be built by our own community. Um, uh, and my background, I think my there's been a series of things that led me to running Daylight, probably starting way back when I had my first job in, in Australia, I wrote our migrant employment strategy. Um, and why I want to mention that is that I heard some really great advice very early on in my career, um, which was that um, diversity isn't just a moral imperative. It's that when you have diverse teams you ref that reflect the customers that you have, you understand them better and you just build better things. Now, uh, that was 20 years ago. Um, it still feels like we're learning that lesson the hard way. Um, uh, but my career has really broadly been divided into two halves. There's what I um, affectionately call the day job, which was work in financial services, consulting, I worked at Prudential PLC, kind of auditing their global regulatory project, projects. I worked, worked at a merchant bank in central London, rolling out internet banking and implementing their banking systems. Uh, so a fair bit of time working traditional corporate jobs. So that was my day job. The latter part of my career, I call my gay job. Um, because uh, in 2017, I was asked to do a turnaround of a company called Gaydar, which uh, many of your, 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 your audience will, will know is about 20 years old. It was one of the first businesses designed specifically for LGBT folks um, that was delivered through digital channels. Um, when I was there, two things happened that were really excited, exciting. Number one is that I could bring my whole authentic self to work um, because working in corporate environments for me was pretty tough. There were times when I would look up what um, what straight people were doing on the weekend so that I could have conversations with my team. Um, uh, but there was very much a, a, a constant pressure to fit in, particularly in big corporates and consulting world. And suddenly I'm in Gaeta, a very queer um, company focused on my own community. And I found that my engagement and my, my whole energy levels went right up. Um, so that, and that became a really pivotal moment for me in understanding that actually going towards purpose, making an impact was really important. Um, the second thing that happened was that I was talking to our customers and I, and I spent a lot of time talking to customers and found that they were using chat rooms that were for dating and social networking to understand how to navigate through healthcare, how to navigate through money, how to find jobs and how to find homes. And it, it really dawned upon me that we we're approaching the end of the second decade of the, of the new millennium and people in my community were still underserved. They weren't able to find the expertise, the platforms that they needed. And so since then I've been building specifically for my community. Um, as a result, all of my businesses have been impact businesses. My last one was a two-sided marketplace around mental health and uh, fast forward to uh, just shy of a year ago, um, the pandemic had hit and uh, some European investors wanted to build an LGBT bank. And of course, my first point of call was to focus on impact um, directly for the community rather than just marketing and other things like that that we see in, in incumbent world. So um, my career has been has been pretty varied. Um, I've seen banks try to do the right thing and, and fail. I've seen uh, LGBT companies try to do the right thing and fail and do exceptionally well in other ways. And so Daylight feels like a real combination of lots of experiences that um, that have led me to a place that can make a really tangible outcome for my community. Thank you so much Rob, for that um, great insight. And, and, and something you said, I mean, isn't it amazing over 20 years, the, the lessons that you learn continue to be lessons that we need to learn um, across society. Um, I think the idea of bringing, bringing your authentic self is such a good fundamental basic idea of where we all need to to get to um, and of course getting there requires such incredible hard work so thank you for sharing um, what would be really great is you've articulated uh, the journey the need daylight being created perhaps just another opportunity to maybe describe what daylight is and where we currently are with it would be great yeah sure thing so uh, daylight is a challenger bank um, 
or a digital bank. There's lots of different uh, nomenclature to describe what it is that we do. But fundamentally, we offer a mobile first experience to LGBT consumers where they can manage their day to day finances. Um, but everything from the ground up has been built specifically around the needs and the pain points of the LGBT community. And you might be asking yourself, why do LGBT folks need specialist services around money? Um, I think there's, there's, there's a really simple way of answering this question. Um, banks have had a generation or more to prepare for the realities of LGBT consumers. I mean, we have been in the press very vocally since the AIDS crisis. Most of it has not been very positive, but more recently it has been. Um, and incumbent banks have recognized that we're here because they've invested so much money marketing to us. Um, Pride has turned from being a protest event. If you look at Pride in London, it's largely a corporate sponsorship event. Um, there are rainbows stuck over everything as advertising to my community. Um, so we are recognized by, um, by corporate finance as being a really valuable segment. And yet for some reason, they've never been able to connect the dots between this really valuable group of consumers and the needs that they actually have. Instead, we've been shoehorned into traditional services. And I think um, there's a confluence of things all happening at once. Um, we, I'm a 40 year old man, which means that I've lived with one foot in and one foot out of the closet. You know, I've had to be closeted at workplaces, universities, school, all sorts of things. And as a result, there was a kind of attitude of, look, things are getting a little bit easier, take what you're given. Um, uh, but there's now, LGBT rights have progressed a really long way. We have legal protections, we have social protections, we've got employer protections, and these things have really changed. And so suddenly you've got a generation like me who are like, hang on a second, why should I accept table scraps? But not only that, we've got, a, a, an entire generation, Gen Z, coming up who have seen LGBT folks overrepresented on TV, completely normalized through pop culture, and they're slamming into institutions that have just never really taken their needs very seriously. And so um, the way we describe it in business terms, because I, I, I'm very proud of the impact we make, but fundamentally we are a for-profit business, is that there are 30 million LGBT consumers. We spend more than the GDP of Mexico every year. And if you put all of the LGBT folks in America into a single state, we'd be the second largest behind California. And what would be really great is maybe if I could ask you to start articulating some of the specific challenges that your target community, the LGBT community have, especially dealing with the current financial system and the way they transact. And I know that's something that we briefly talked about. It'd be great to, to get a sense of that from you. Yeah, sure. And there are three parts to this. First, there is the the day to day management of your money, um, what we'll call first order issues. The second is second order issues. So what are the implications of where those pain points are and how do they impact your life outside of that? And the third set is there are kind of ecosystem issues, things like employment discrimination. All of these things have a, have a compounding effect on, on the economic success of my community. So I'm going to start with um, making this very personal, very persona driven to give you a bit of a sense about how LGBT folks experience um, uh, the wider economy. So um, we'll start with a 14 year old queer woman. What we know about her and in the States that she doesn't know yet and her family don't know is that she should be saving for college already at 14. Now you might be asking why, it's really simple. When she comes out to her parents, there is a 40% chance they'll no longer support her economically. Um, so as a result, that woman, toss of a coin, maybe she's going to get help, maybe she's not, um, she will join a cohort of LGBT folks who come out of college with 50% more college debt on average than, um, than other Americans. So from the get-go, our financial needs are different. We, we're settled with more debt to begin with because we don't have access to the same support systems that the wider population has. Um, we then enter our 20s. We're still trying to figure out what it's like to be a queer person in a world that wasn't really designed for us in which there is a, still a significant headwind against LGBT rights. And um, that woman will discover that her healthcare costs are different, um, that the financial education that she had received has not prepared her at all for the realities of living um, a life as somebody whose biology is a determinant on her lifestyle. And as a result, by the time she gets to her 30s, like many LGBT folks, she'll be asked questions like this. Do you want a home or a family? You can have one. If you're a trans person, where an average cost of a transition is $100,000, um, 
you're going to have to choose potentially between making a down payment on a home, you know, affording a transition and indeed family planning um, where the average cost of a child in America for a queer person is $55,000. Now that's before you've fed them, clothed them, bathed them, anything else. That's just the cost of fertility treatment in order to allow those people to have families. And so our 30s then become the first decade in which we have to start making significant compromises. Um, that story continues right the way through to retirement um, because we need to retire in safer places and because we focus on our communities, LGBT folks in America retire in places that are on average 40% more expensive, um, which means that our, our end of life outcomes from a financial perspective are woefully inadequate. Our home ownership rates are very low um, and our, our preparation for retirement is very low. So from the age of 14 until we retire, we need specialist advice, we need specialist products, we need specialist support. Um, and those things just don't really exist. Um, and so um, it gives you a bit of a sense about actually, rather than ask where are the, where are the small number of areas where it's different for LGBT folks, um, is actually saying that it is different by default. And so um, the space for a company like Daylight is to look at those, and these are all still very macro trends, but then to dive down on those into proper financial education, access to the financial products that we need, the advice that helps LGBT people to live a fulfilling life as the first generation of folks that can live really openly, and the ability to retire in places um, that are meaningful and safe for our community. So LGBT folks need their money handled really differently. The rest of the world is catching up, um, but it's 2021 and our community is suffering, so we didn't have time to wait. And that's very much why we set out to create Daylight, to tackle these systemic problems, these macroeconomic problems, um, progressively right the way along. Well, thank um, you so much. Sorry, sorry. I, I mean, no, thank you so much for that. And, and, and I guess, um... Well, I mean, that was that was a really clear uh, sense of of a whole, almost a whole lifespan of challenges. Like you say, the best word to describe it is systemic, in terms of exclusion. Um, and you talked about some of the specialist financial products that you you're creating. I wonder whether you can maybe give a couple of examples, just in terms of how that design looks like. Um, maybe to address some of the challenges that you've described, just to bring it to life a bit more. Um, and and then and then a, a follow up question, which probably is related around why. And this is a question I think you know, as as algebra, we're we're also being asked, right? Which is why do you need to exist as a specialist thing? Are you not exceptionalizing a community by existing? And I'm going to start so, with the latter question first, and then I'm going to go to the former. Why does it need to be? Why do we need to take matters into our own hand? Because it's 2021, and all we're getting is rainbows on stuff. Um, investment from financial institutions in our space tend to go towards employer branding, customer acquisition, and support for internal staff. Um, they're seen as brand benefits. Um, and those are, those are really important, right? Giving LGBT people a chance to steer the ship of financial institutions means that they are more likely in 10, 15 years to have developed the political capital to be able to actually deliver change for our community. Um, so I, I, I don't, um, I will never look at those opportunities as being a bad thing, but I think um, this, there continues to be a disconnect between that investment and that focus and the actual products that are served for our community. And frankly, we don't have time to wait. These are macroeconomic problems that sound too big to be dealt with, but why should we be sitting there waiting another five to 10 years for an entire generation of folks in their thirties to have lost the opportunity to build families? The reality is, is that the world has moved too slow and we're taking matters into our own hand because the state of affairs that I painted for you before is a 2021 state of affairs. That's not 1980, that's not 2005. This isn't the time of marriage equality. This is what happens 10 years after marriage equality and we're still not there. So frankly, I'm too impatient and these are real people's lives in, at, at, at stake. Um, and I'm gonna use that then as a bit of a springboard to talk about how we are different. Um, so, um, the simplest answer is we can educate our consumers on how their biology impacts their financial lives. That's a very, very simple thing. And you'll find that there are many banks that are focused on affinity groups, lifestyle, um, purpose that are focused on educating their consumers about the things that matter to them and in deeply culturally relevant ways. Um, LGBT consumers need more than just education. Um, and I'm going to start with something very, very tangible. My co-founder, Billy, is a trans woman. Um, you may think that having a card with your name on it um, is a vanity project or is a nice to have. 
for a trans American who takes a card to point of sale um, that doesn't show the gender in which they present, 40% um, of people that are forced to do that are subjected to abuse or violence. Why, you know, this card doesn't look like you. Why does your card say this name on it? Or actually then it will, it will signal to somebody at point of sale. And that is a complete, it's anyone's guess what that person's attitudes are going to be. Um, it signals to them that this is a trans person. And this is already a community that is incredibly um, disadvantaged, financially excluded and subjected to violence. And right there and then our ability to change the surname for a woman getting married to a man, but our inability to change the name of a trans person who is affirming their correct gender shows where systemic homophobia and transphobia sits within our financial system. Um, for her to change her name at Capital One, Billy, my co-founder, she had to go to a doctor, she had to go to a lawyer, she had to go to the courthouse three times, she had to take a court order to a notary, and then she had to take that to a bank teller. She had to get permission from many different people in order to get her name represented fairly on her card to improve her safety. Now, not only was that a very costly experience, costing her hundreds of dollars, um, it was a really unsafe one and dehumanizing, right? We don't know what, and she outed herself as a trans person five to seven times during that process. We have no idea what the attitudes of those individuals were. And so instead we've put her through a really dehumanizing process that is expensive. Um, every creditor, every bank, every loan you've ever taken has an esoteric process that we force trans folk to go through. Um, uh, and all to be able to improve their safety at point of sale. The daylight opportunity is really simple. Um, we ask people to sign up for an account using their legal name. We're required to do that under, under various laws to make sure we know who our customers are. We ask them what their, what their name that they'd like to be referred to is, their preferred name, and we ask them what their pronouns are. Um, from that point onwards, we will always refer to a trans customer um, in the name that they prefer. Um, we don't need to know their gender, actually. Gender, gendering banking services doesn't really help. Our pronouns are a show of respect and important for designing our service layer. Um, and so Billy can get a card in her name through the onboarding process, no time, no effort, faster, cheaper, and better than anybody else in the market. Um, that is an example of how we can take our deep empathy for our community and we can start looking at problems uh, that we need to solve. Thank you for that incredible testimony um, and, and articulating so clearly the challenges of exclusion for, for so many communities, um, which of course is, is not understood if you don't deeply understand them. Um, which, so so when, when, I, when I talked about the beginning, um, specialized products actually, and, and we'll go on to this, product isn't just financial product, it's, it's also products around engagement, understanding, design, um, which is incredibly important. So I'm gonna ask a question now, which feels uh, almost redundant um, given what you've just described, which is about you know the project that we're working on now, which is why is the concept of life, lifestyle, values-based banking so important as a means of addressing financial or addressing financial exclusion and ensuring we embed financial inclusion within our system? Yeah, and I can answer that from an impact perspective, which is that there are communities that need help and they're not getting it. Um, or, and I can answer that in a consumer perspective, which is this one. Um, we can go into Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or wherever, and we can get a curated feed of things that are special just for us. We uh, Indeed, personalization is a core part of just about every technology product we have. Why should any of our banks look the same? Why is it that every time, I'm a, I'm a first direct customer in the UK, um, why is it that every time I log into First Direct, it has to look the same as probably if you logged into First Direct? It doesn't need to. Our needs are different, even at an individual level. Some of us have families, some of us have kids, some of us don't, some of us are freelancers, some of us are elderly. Um, the problem is, is that the industry as a whole has not been able to move sufficiently beyond its business model of building scalable products that serve the mass market, probably one or two standard deviations away from average, um, towards being able to um, provide bespoke solutions for the people that need it. They sell the same product. It's always a credit card. It's always a deposit product. It's always, you know, those, those things are out there. Those are the tools they have to play with. But they, um, you know, in the last five years that people are developing voice of the customer in, within their organizations because they, they're so internally focused.
Um, and at the end of the day, uh, they're not getting it right. Um, if they were, we wouldn't need organizations like us to come and nip at their heels because I think regulation has gotten us to a point, um, and particularly in Europe, you know, we've had very strong protections for different minority communities through regulation, um, but those companies haven't changed. The sponsorships of Pride haven't moved the dial. Um, you know, the rainbows on things have not improved the financial lives of our community. And I think um, the, the simplest way that we explain this problem for our community, but I think it applies to many different minority communities, is that we are treated as monolithic groups. You know, um, LGBT Americans, uh, massive, massive amounts of diversity between who they are. And, and I think while banks are run uh, predominantly um, by wealthy folks, often living in coastal cities, you know, the, there is a center of gravity that thinks of LGBT consumers in particular as two incomes, no kids, the dinks, right? Um, we're not spending money on school uniforms, so we must be doing pretty well. Um, it ignores the ecosystem problems like we face employment discrimination, home house discrimination, uh, lack of financial education, and we're excluded across many parts of society. Um, but the other thing is, is that only 30% of our community is in long-term relationships, so it can't all be two income, no kids. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum. 20% of queer people of color are unbanked or underbanked. These are people living in cash economies, and they deserve banking just as much as everybody else. And while mainstream organizations look at us as a monolithic group, I mean, most banks don't even know who their queer people are, so how can they serve them? But when they do, they kind of go, okay, well, let's, let's lump all the queers together. We'll put a rainbow on something, call it a day. Well done, pat ourselves on the back, run out of the campaign. And unfortunately, that's just not how you do business. It's not going to help the lives of our consumers. And I think... Um, we're going to have to show them the way to embed diversity and customer empathy in what we do so that they acquire us, so that they lose market share. Because I think sometimes you have to put commercial pressure on companies and regulators aren't going to put it on the way that we need. So that's our job. Which is, how do you, and maybe this is a personal question, reconcile shifting a body, a sector into doing what should be the right thing? versus having to use the language of the business case of so commercializing it to nudge them in the right direction, right? So this, this notion of this is just right because it's what people want and it's what the needs of a minority are, which you may not otherwise understand because it's a small group, right? This values-based proposition versus having to nudge them using the language that they understand. Is that something that you're consciously doing around you know, educating the sector about how do you improve versus I'm gonna eat away at your profit and your market share because that's the language you understand. But at the same time, also making sure, but also look, here's how you understand deeply these communities, right? And, and it's something that I think about a lot with my work and, and the, the analogy I, I always use is you have to fly the plane whilst refueling it, right? And I wonder what your, your thoughts on, on reconciling those two things. Yeah, and I think it's, I have three jobs. Um, I have to develop propositions and build them for my community. Um, like all minority communities, we need allyship and we need to work collaboratively with partners. So in order to deliver those propositions, I, um, my team have to work with our banking partners, with our network partners, with anybody to educate them about how they need to change their product in order to just integrate with us. I'm, you know, one of our rules, no dead naming um, means that I can't just integrate with this platform and have someone dead name because I didn't have attention to detail. So I've got to build for us, help others to build for them so that they can integrate with us. Um, and that's the second job. And the third job is just wider education in the industry. And that is not just in operators in retail banking, that is VCs, that is regulators, that is even our own customers who have been convinced that everything is fine for a really long time, um, being able to explain to them that actually they've been getting a pretty raw deal. Um, now, all of that is work um, as a minority. I mean, I've had to have very difficult conversations with folks who have accused us of anti-straight bias, which feels very all lives matter uh, to us. And it, and, it, and it shows the the challenge that minority communities have trying to operate within um, what amounts to a structural system that wasn't designed for anybody other than you know predominantly white people, um, and you know I benefit from lots of that in, in from that in lots of ways. But we have to be tackling these things, and and the reason for that is is that we're a purpose driven company, um, and there are inevitably going to be conflicts over purpose uh, between purpose and profit. But here's what I know about our community: after a generation of being sponsored at prides and advertised to with rainbows, 
there's a, there's a cynicism about the role that institutions play in supporting the existing um, the existing normal for our community. Um, and if we don't follow through and be authentic in delivering against our purpose, we lose the game. That's it. Authenticity is our greatest strength. Um, and so my last question, I guess, is, I mean, yourself and Billy will have a deep amount of lived experience of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, but what I would love to get a sense of is how you systemically and systematically ensure the lived experience of your users are at the heart of, of everything that you do and maybe give a, giving us a sense of how you engage um, with the community to understand their needs on a regular basis. What does that look like um, for you, um, both to share uh, and hopefully for, for others who will be watching this interview later to get a sense of just what it takes? That's a great question. Um, we look at it this way. Um, we are built for, um, for LGBT people by LGBT people. And that doesn't mean the 10 people that work for Daylight. I mean, it does. Everyone of our team is either a queer millennial, a queer Gen Z person, or the family member, direct family member of another LGBT person. So they bring that lived experience to the table. That's our immediate accelerator. Um, but our customers, we call them Daylight Builders at this stage because we are building the future of the finance system for our community. And in fact, we even look for certain types of folks. We look for early adopters. We look for people that have purchased at queer shops that have engaged in a political um, dimension relating to their identity because these are people that are there to help us build. It is a challenge, you know, when you have such a diverse audience, um, setting yourself a brand promise of, of seeing people um, there are an infinite permutations of wonderful diversity in the world. Um, and so it does mean that um, we've got to pay really, really close attention to what everybody is asking of us. You know, we, and we encounter this stuff, we live and breathe it every day. We're constantly looking for feedback. If you want processes and structures, we incentivize our team based on customer insight and growth metrics. We're a startup. So Net, prom net promoter score is important, referrals are important, and you don't get those if you're not developing great services for your customers. Um, uh, but we also have a structured program of talking to what we aim to be at least an LGBT person every day. And before we even started building a single thing, we had spoken to over a thousand LGBT consumers. Because at the end of the day, um, trying to solve problems for a community without being deeply part of it is a fail. It, it, it fails every time. Um, and so, uh, Entrepreneurs, business people, people working in corporate, they all hate doing customer interviews. The silly thing is, and they hate it because nobody wants to be told that they're wrong. Um, and when you invest so much in things, um, it's much easier to sit within a wider structural environment that just continues to support you. If your boss is happy, then everyone's happy. Startups don't have that luxury. Um, I was told very early on by an investor, no one cares about your project um, and no one's gonna come to your business naturally. Um, and really what they were trying to encourage me to do is just to live and breathe those customer pain points to develop that deep empathy in order to build products. So if you aren't measuring somebody on speaking to customers every day or every week, if you're not measuring them on their sharing of that data and you're not measuring them on customer metrics around satisfaction at an individual level, you're never going to get the, get what you need. So we just sit amongst our folks. The, 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 the irony of all of that is, is that customers tell you all the answers. Um, so why not build exactly what they want? Um, I would love to see the industry make that shift um, uh, because it's the only way to move forward. Rob, this has been incredibly insightful. Thank you so much for your time, for the work that you're doing, for the disruptions that you're making on behalf of many communities, because it's not just one community that benefits from the work that you do. Um, and we wish you the best of luck.